Welcome to the Wild Ones podcast, episode 34. This is the show where we chat about bike stuff. I'm Jimmy, and I'm back with producer Emily and bike mechanic Nick. How you doing, guys? Good, thanks. Very good. I had a very large breakfast this morning, and I am feeling full of energy. So I'm going to sit in this chair without moving, and all of that energy is going to come out of my mouth. Great, good news. Breakfast <laughs> wasn't in your original plan that you told us about a couple of weeks ago. Of course it was. Breakfast is always in the plan. I don't need breakfast. Breakfast is in the night at nine no, o'clock. That most important meal of the day is nonsense. So anyway, Emily, your speech from last week got a lot of attention, a lot more than we either of us thought was going to happen. Yes, it did. Yeah. Um, I was actually quite nervous after the podcast went out because I wasn't sure how it was going to be received. Um, maybe just because a lot of our audience is male and I appreciate that. I don't know, it might just not be up their street or just, I don't know, not connect with people. But actually, I, I was so nervous, in fact, that usually I look through our comments of most of our videos, but especially the podcast, just trying to gauge feedback. And I like to do that knowing that I probably won't crop up as a discussion that much because I don't speak that much. But I was so worried that I didn't dare look at comments. And I said to you, I've been avoiding the internet all day just in case. But you had a look at the comments, Jimmy, and they were actually really, really nice. Very, very open, I guess. I, I, I don't necessarily need to be supported myself, but just open to the idea and the discussion. That, oh, this made me think, you know, which was really, really um, heartening, I would say. And it's definitely made me feel more open to speaking more. So there you go. I, I feel like there has been a societal slash cultural shift in this country because I feel like if we had made, if if you if we had posted something like that ten years ago, I don't think the response would have been the same. I think it really shows that so many more people are so open to understanding other people's point of view and what impacts them, or what affects them, and I think that is brilliant. Yeah, lots perhaps, more change yeah. to do, but I think it's brilliant that uh, people are generally more open. Yeah, or perhaps we just attract an audience of very nice people that are willing that's maybe that, not everyone yeah, but perhaps, we just attract yeah. those people <laughs> and thank you to you the listeners because I, I, I felt very supported also at the end of last week's episode we heard about nick's flip-flop iron man we've had a few messages from listeners dying to know more one who wrote us was bernard who said hi team stumbled upon your youtube video which were very very entertaining and now started listening to the podcast during my training can we please hear more about Nick's Ironman, as I'm a regular Ironman participant and feel there might be some fun stories around his experience. Lots of love. Greetings from Switzerland. What does he mean regular? Does he do it more than once? <laughs> I'm sure there's something you, you took off. Uh, it was a disaster from the get-go. Uh, the shoes, the wetsuit. The, I mean, I stood on that beach before they like let you go off and it's early in the morning and... I just remember when the cannons went off, I thought, what have I done wrong for my life to end up over here? Because I did a quick bit of math and realized I could be out here for 15 hours. Um, so yeah, it was just a, a long, long, long day of suffering. How I much mean, on the bike, I got a full sense of confidence. This is going really well. I'm going to do well here. But then I got off the bike uh, and yeah, it just went wrong from there. How much training did you do beforehand? Because I can't, I, I really, I, I've seen you walk and you do not look like you'd last I can't, very long I, I, I'm not built for running, but uh, I was in the army at the time in the infantry. So we did a lot of running, but generally speaking, the furthest I would have gone was about eight miles um, with weight, not a normal run. So I did a bit of that. And then I was swimming a lot at the time and I come from a swimming background. Cycling came easy to me. Um, I wasn't the fittest moment, but yeah, not a, not a lot of training at all because it was just a, I mainly did it, it's free holiday. <laughs> so yeah which wasn't a holiday because I was suffering for so much afterwards. What did you learn from your experience? Uh, stick to one sport. <laughs> just, just <laughs> which is bike. What? Yeah, it's just much more efficient. You get a Sw lot swimming. further on a bike than... No, no, no. <laughs> it's too cold over here for swimming. <laughs> we well, can get in a heated pool. No, it's no. It's cold when you get out. I I'd swim again if I was back home where it's warm. Anyway, let's see what's going on in the news. So... Pictures of what apparently is the new SRAM Red group set has leaked online. So we're a bit late on this one, and that's because we're filming the podcast a bit earlier than usual at the moment to work around Nick's actual job. Uh, but leaked images of levers, cassette, rear mech, and calipers allegedly from the new SRAM Red have appeared online. The photos appear to be in line with patents we've already seen, and it's very possible this could be for real. 
The hoods look smaller in size and more ergonomic than the current red, which makes sense, as this puts it in line with Rival and Force D2. There's also auxiliary buttons at the top of the shifters that we assume might be customizable. The rear derailleur and disc calipers both have cutout sections that suggest they're probably been a bit of a focus on weight reduction, and it also looks like they're taking inspiration from the mountain bike world. So the rear derailleur appears to include a version of SRAM's magic wheel. This is basically a pulley that allows the outer part of the wheel to keep turning, even if something gets stuck in the inner part, like a stick or debris. That's really hard to, to understand. Have you seen one of these before, Nick? Yes, so on the Type T mountain bike rear MX that SRAM's released, it's on there. So if you imagine the teeth is like an outer ring that is separate from the inner pulley wheel that's got the bearings in it. So if a stick was to get in and seize that inner wheel, stop it from moving, the actual teeth will still rotate on top of the outer wheel. So your chain can still move forward. You're not going to just snap your rear derailleur off. So the pulley wheels have like a free wheel in them kind of thing? Pr pretty much, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so it's still all unconfirmed reports at this stage, but it's looking pretty likely New Red will be released this year. Uh, I've had a look at the photos. I think it looks nice. It looks really good. Um, you've got a couple of theories on some bits and pieces around it. So there's obviously these auxiliary buttons on the shifters, which, that like, Shimano have been doing that for years, though, haven't they? Uh, yes, but this works slightly different, I think. Obviously, it's just theories. Um, the auxiliary buttons on the photos, I don't think are actually buttons. I think those are just uh, rubber grommets uh, hiding where your reach adjust might be. I right. think the buttons are going to be on the inside of the levers. Inside of the lever, rather yeah. right. Okay. So if you set up SRAM at the moment, you've got you can set so, up on so an like app. A, like a like a Campag Thummy almost. Similar, yeah, but a bit higher up. So yeah. I don't know. You, you most likely would be able to set them up for extra things. How you want to shift if you just want to use one lever on one side, or whether you want to activate a drop post to it. Um, there's other theories that it might be able to control your head units. Yeah. So instead of having to take your hands off to change. Again, this is all like, Shimano stuff, isn't it? Or at yes. least the head unit bit of it. Is oh, Shimano or Campag stuff. as well has done it before. So it's not, Comeback actually has buttons. They've had buttons from the first uh, EPS that came out inside the levers that you can use for head units uh, and things like that. So that's one thing. Um, other theories are, if you're looking at the chain and cassette, it looks exactly like the mountain bike type T chain and cassette, which is, I think, really good. Uh, so on that one, they say the hard, more power you put through the group set while shifting, the better it will shift. So what? currently at the moment when you shift on almost all groups that you have to kind of clutch your knees or reduce your power slightly to kind of not make that a whole clunking noise and yeah. just destroy your group state where uh, on the mountain bike ones uh, apparently optimal shifting is where you can shift above 500 watts it'll still shift perfectly so in racing or if you in the wrong gear when you hit a steep hill you don't have to worry about just putting the power through and pressing the button so you think that that mountain bike tech might be coming into yes, the SRAM uh, red. The, the, well, this is pure speculation, but just from the photos, the chain and cassette looks exactly the same. That does sound good. Type T. So, and it would make sense because if they're going to release a new SRAM red this year, you would hope that they kind of making it better, not just doing the same thing with an added gear, like what's happened in the past has gone from 11 to 12 speed on certain group sets, uh, where with this, if they can make it lighter, they can make you shift under power. Um, yeah, it's just all good stuff that, could hopefully come out with it. You have a theory on the power meter as well. Um, I'm hoping they do the power meter similar to what they've done with uh, Rival and Force, where you don't just have the, the double chain ring with the power meter integrated that weighs out along with the teeth. Um, I'm hoping they're going to do it as part of the axle as well. I can't see why not, because I already have the technology in all the other group sets. Is, is the axle one double-sided? Well, I've, I've, I've got one on my Rival, and it's definitely one-sided. Yes, but the the... Crankbase is also one. It's, it's not about sided. It's more about it's 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 axle based. If that makes sense. No, it does. I, yeah, I, pedals yeah. pedals uh, run down the the aspect of double sided or single sided. Meaning there's a power meter just in one pedal. Yeah. But the one axle combines both sides of the crank arms. Fact or speculation? Speculation. But no, it's just a fact. The, the <laughs> axle. Wait, you said speculation and fact. <laughs> well, it's, it's just. I mean, I'm not a power meter expert. Right. But so it's so it's not a fact, but you're pretty confident. I'm pretty confident. Okay. Yes. I look forward. I look forward to seeing comments. I might even look at the comments this time. It'll be the exact time. opposite to Emily's comments where I'm just getting rinsed, like <laughs> usual, but yeah. So SRAM are definitely keeping very quiet on this one. I actually messaged one of the SRAM guys that I talked to quite a bit. Um, 
and I, 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 I messaged him and I said, uh, looks like red, new Reds coming out this year. Are we going to be able to get a set for Cade Media? It says that he's seen it and he hasn't responded, but he always responds when I message him. Left you so unread. He has, yeah. So I'm assuming it's a lot easier for him to say nothing than it is to lie to me, yep. which is which is why there's no response. Before Force, they let us know months in advance and we had the group set. The two of us. So, yes. I mean, they did tell us where this one, they've not told us anything. So it's a bit of a... Well, so, so what Nick's referring to is when the new SRAM Force D2, D2. was launched, uh, it's pro- what is it, a year ago now or something like that? Something like that, whatever it was. Um, Nick got asked if he would build a bike for the launch content of that video, which obviously I built with him. So it was initially via Nick's relationship with SRAM, uh, and then they asked, or they brought me into the loop on it as the person that was actually filming the video. Um, and the build video is absolutely massive. It's got something like 90 odd thousand views, um, which actually got launched on the day that it went live. So I was kind of hoping, I, I, I was kind of hoping by me messaging him, he might be like, oh, actually, yeah, let's get let's get another new group set over to those guys. And we would have had it for launch, but they've gone quiet. So I'm guessing we're not going to have it for launch. Shram's coming to visit me next week, so... Fingers crossed. <laughs> it's still a thing, obviously. It's. What price point do we think it's going to be? I'm assuming it's going to be really expensive because it's their top end group set. The Campag group set is four and a half thousand for their top thousand. end one. Five and a half thousand. Yeah. Uh, Dura Ace is three thousand six hundred. But Dura Ace and SRAM becomes a bit more complicated because of how you spec it. How you spec it. Yeah, really. You've got power meters, no power meters. Um, I'm hoping that it it comes in line with Shimano and not Campag because that's. But obviously, we just don't know. Uh, in the past, I think SRAM's released their rival in force ahead of Shimano, and it's always come out uh, considerably cheaper than Shimano. But it's it's going to be a lot of money. But it's, SRAM do generally like to do things a bit different, and hopefully, one of the things they've done a bit different is found a way of making it a bit cheaper as well. It would, if you know, like say for example, big group set manufacturer launch their new top end group set, and they go, actually, we've not managed to save any weight. It still weighs however many kilos, which is pretty light because it's our top end one. But what we have managed to do is cut the cost, so it's five hundred quid cheaper. I would be very happy. Oh no, with that. but no, 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 not for me. <laughs> they've cut out. There's loads of cutouts in there. So if you've lost weight, you've lost material, so it should be cheap as well. Can't you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I understand if you made it lighter by different materials, but if you just cut out pieces of the rotors and the, the rear mech, it should be, yeah, a smaller hood, like so that's it. less. Yeah. Everything's good. less. It should just be cheaper. Yep, the the yeah, chain's fair. got holes in it, so that's less <laughs> materials. The cassettes have got holes in it. It has to be less. I like your point. So the new CEO for Team Ineos has said he will do all that he can to help the Tour of Britain get back on the race calendar. So currently the future of the Tour of Britain hangs in the balance as its owner's Sweet Spot went into liquidation last autumn. Sweet Spot apparently owes around £700,000 in unpaid rights fees to British cycling. It's thought that more detailed plans regarding the race's future will be made public next week by British cycling. I think this begs the question, does pro cycling need a major revamp in this country? 100% yes. It's an easy one, yes. Probably not even just in this country, just in general, but how, yes. how, how do they owe British Cycling £700,000 is what I don't get. Like, uh, what has British Cycling done for the event to justify £700,000? Are they giving them the conversation? I don't I mean, I, it's genuinely, I don't know what it is. I mean, there might be some really valid reasons, but it's just how. I have so many issues with British Cycling. As we know. (laughs) I I could understand owing the council money for the police and things like that, which you would need for road closures and things. But It's an expensive... I mean, any race is an expensive thing to put on. But but British Cycling gets paid by its members. I'm I'm assuming, this is obviously speculation, that because it is the Tour of Britain, it's a certain level of race which requires British Cycling to tick all of the boxes so that you get all of the appropriate professional level points and to do that they say you have to give us x amount of money yeah but no but that doesn't make sense because if you if you bridge your cycling and you run all cycling in england you want to have a tour of britain as a thing you, you need it then why don't you pay all of that the women's tour got cancelled as well didn't it i think a while so, yeah. ago so there's basically no big major race in the uk now i, I just i mean as 
we as a shop used to sponsor some of the local races. But the problem is that you, you get 60 athletes showing up and then no real spectators apart from the odd parent or spouse. Um, and there's just no return because most of those lads try and, if you race at a high level, either get everything free or... Or you're bound to contracts or bound, already. Or you take it quite seriously. You essentially, you think or you do know what, what you're after and you just kind of buy everything online by yourself so you're not supporting the bike shops um that's why we as a shop we've gone more into the gravel because a gravel events um some of the gravel events like dirt uh, reeve i think gets about two thousand people down for the event and they're there for like two sometimes three days so it's a captive audience so sponsoring an event like that you've, you you can actually see the numbers of people showing up um yeah it just seems to be working better and, and if if people like that are showing up to an event like that, they are very definitely consumers as yes, well. Yes, hundred percent. So like, yeah. you know, you can have a stall there as a brand, and the chances are, if people aren't buying, then you're at least getting a lot of good contact with those people that are actually buying products that you pre yeah. presumably sell the, as a brand. The, the other issue with the road cycling is people generally show up for the race. They so take it seriously because they've trained for it, and it's it's a big deal. Um, so they show up, they're very serious, they warm up, they race, they finish, and they go home. And that's it. So there's no captive audience. Where some Enduro mountain bike is really good for it. The Ard Rock, uh, I think the, the event sells out in minutes. And then it's, it's, thousands, it's limited to the actual village can't take more people. They don't have the infrastructure to, to make the ride bigger. And people come down. But after the events, everybody's staying around for beer or for food and socializing. And it's, it's, it's a whole weekend away. It's a big trip. So like I say, it's just a better... Set up. I don't think road cycling could ever do that because there's no actual scenario where you can do this. So for them to change, they're going to have to do something well, else. The, the equivalent would be like Ride London. Yes. Because what you're essentially saying is an event where people are also participants. And that's yeah. something like Ride London, which historically has been huge, 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 huge event when it, you know, it's a big yeah. closed road thing and people get to go and have a good time. Uh, something that me and Emily have definitely talked about numerous times in the past is... One of the things that we think is rubbish in cycling is that, the t well, I'll, I'll speak for myself at this point and how many can decide if she agrees <laughs> with me or not, is uh, the teams being so heavily branded in that they're constantly changing, they constantly have new names, they're very uh, corporate and therefore it's really hard to get behind a team. Like, for example, if I am in the mood for watching football, I am going to watch Sunderland play football. And I'm probably going to enjoy it because of You're where... probably not going to enjoy it if you're watching Sunderland. <laughs> no, but I do. I do. But, but, I do. but also, I, I, I've been saying this for quite a while now because you'll have no loyalty to a single player because I bet you can't name me a single Sunderland player. It's a, towards a team, which is better. Teams no, need can, names and they need colours <laughs> because football is a really good example. I mean, footballers get paid the most money, but it's because they generate a lot of money as well. The, the, the clubs generate money in terms of people buy into this these clubs lifelong and the players change every few years or every year um, and people like the players but as soon as that player has gone to another club you don't lose all your supporters they stay with the club mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I, I definitely think that cycling would benefit from that there's too many moving parts if you've got your your players or your cycle yeah. your team moving and you have the team name changing there's and colours and the colours changing there's nothing that that Sticks, is there, behind yeah, you to that The one. other problem that came in is when, I'm going to use Rafa as an example, when Rafa started making their kits and all the playing colours, people before that tend to buy a lot of team kits. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the teams are getting money for this or if the suppliers are just making knocker versions, but that needs to come back. Uh, EF's done a good job lately with doing really cool stuff and collaborations with uh, Palace and people buying it again because they want to wear the kit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and a lot of elitism kicked into cycling and people started making fun of people wearing team kit um, and things like that. I mean, there was a story, well, I can actually, the, uh, one of the local riders around here uh, kicked off massively on a ride, I think it was last year or the year before, because he saw somebody riding around in a national champs jersey oh. and saying, you've got no right in doing this because uh, it's disrespectful, you didn't earn the jersey. And he went off on a massive rant on this ride about how this kid shouldn't be riding in a national champs or similar to somebody riding a world champs jersey. And he went on and on and on and it carried on for a while. And one of the riders in the ride just went up to him and said like, I'm not going to mention his name, but said person, 
you do know that is Thomas Maine, the current national champion. <laughs> so that kind of thing. But, but even if it wasn't, if, you, if, if somebody wanted to wear it, wear it. Buy the kit. Because as soon as people start buying into these things again, there's other ways of monetizing the sport, yeah. which will help out. Because it will be really sad if it dies off completely. Mm. Um, I, I, I remember the tri camp we used to go to, uh, the Stabs, their kit had uh like national champs bands on the arms and things like that uh just because he like the guy that designed it liked the, the yeah. style and i remember because we i've probably still got it one of the original jerseys from that which is oh god it's the best part of a decade ago now and i remember someone making some some kind of comment like that or even all that time ago i, I just yeah, it's I, just creating I, barriers isn't it i love pushing against people and going like Do you know what? what what does it matter so so here's an interesting fact for you I wouldn't have had my bike shop if it wasn't for Team Kit. I wanted a specific, I really liked Aqua Saponi kit, but nobody was selling it anymore. And they did a version which was in white and gold and it was outrageous. Um, and I just came up with the idea, why don't I get somebody to actually make me the kit again? Because loads of people do replica kit. And I went to this cafe, local cafe, where they were also making custom kit um, and to go and ask them about this. And while I was there, I came up with the idea of, there's a space for rent next door. If I rent this, I, I can start my bike shop with having a bit of a customer base because right next door was a cycling cafe with loads of people in it. Um, and it was a week later, I opened the shop and started growing it from there. But if I didn't go in there to buy this custom, well, not <laughs> custom, this replica kit of a team, it just never might have. I mean, I was on my way back to moving back to South Africa. <laughs> so, yeah. I think the the, the biggest challenge for pro cycling is ultimately it's it's too traditional and i don't think it's taken into account the fact that the internet has meant that brands have just diversified their marketing budgets so much whereas in the past i mean it still happens a lot a lot of big brands will invest in pro cycling but before that was like the only way to get massive eyes on your brand whereas now because of the internet stuff like podcasts and whatever it is youtube and influencers whether you you know you buy into that or not ultimately there are so many more ways for brands to spend their money and also they have now their own channels where they can connect directly with their audience and also from a viewer's perspective you have way more options for where you put your eyes I guess and put your time so and I don't think that necessarily pro teams have kind of caught on to that I think the, the old school mentality is we turn up, we do our ride, we go home. And that is enough for us to fulfill our obligation to kind of our sponsors. And I don't know if that really works anymore. I just don't know. I don't know. It just feels like there's a bit of a disconnect. Like pro racing's really good and it is fun when you watch, but I don't know. I think that there will be a lot of brands thinking I don't, I'm not getting a return on my investment. And then they pull out and then, you know, you see the smaller races like the Tour of Britain, which is obviously still a big race, but in the context, you know, it's not, a, it's not a Tour de France. I guess if it's not getting the eyes on it, you have to think about why that is. And maybe there needs to be more emphasis on marketing within your team and that kind of thing. I had a suggestion that I gave to British Cycling that I said, which is... It's I, know you, I know you like to think you're important, but I don't think they care about you. Now. <laughs> no, but I just said something, an idea that what they could do is... Um, what happens is they're struggling to put on the races. They were having meetings in the shop quite often about the races and how to put it on. I'm just talking about locally up here. Um, and I said, why don't you, depending on the size of clubs, depending on how big your club is, if you're, you, they need to make different uh, memberships, a race membership for a club, because clubs have to pay to be uh, registered to British Cycling. So make a race membership and make a social membership. So two different things. If you want a club that's going to race and participate in the local races, depending on how many members you have, you have to commit to a set amount of days or pe so people per day for the year, let's say it's 10%. If you've got 100 members, you need to commit to 10 days where you allow one person to go and help out at collective races, get all the clubs to kind of band together. So instead of one club puts on one race, get four or five clubs to help each other. Because up here we've got loads of clubs racing, but they're all fighting for the different races. Just get them all to help and all the races somehow. So yeah, so with the cyclocross scene, do you know, it's like, I guess it's the same with like rugby. You like host. Hosts. Yes. So the league is made up of like yeah. clubs that host an event. So what you're, what you're saying is, well, rather than do that, why not make it 
put less of a burden on one club and actually spread it across multiple clubs to give it a better chance of the, being successful. The cyclocross does well because it gets loads of spectators as well. Well, this, this is something I wanted to talk about is that what if you think about racing in terms of cycling, what do you think of? You think of obviously the grand tours, the big like pinnacle stuff, but the stuff that always gets coverage every single year is professional cyclocross. And I think that's really fascinating because... In the grand scheme of things, people don't care about cyclocross. People aren't even bothering. Like people aren't going like, I'm going to go and buy a, a cyclocross bike and this is going to be my thing. They think about road racing and they buy a road bike and then maybe they get into gravel or whatever. But it's actually cyclocross is a, f a f version of cycling that is like super exciting and super entertaining. And it's got this amazing like vibe and energy around it. And as a result of that, it gets lots of coverage. But it isn't something that people have an interest in actually doing in a mass but that, that's the difference between road racing and crit racing, cyclocross and track. Uh, they're on circuits. So essentially as a spectator, you're going to see the race several times over. And multiple races in yeah. one day. Um, so, I mean, if you look, I, I was watching the cyclocross from a few weeks ago in Belgium or the Netherlands, one of the two um, online, the spectators, the amount of people, and they charge people, I think, as far as I know, to go to watch it. And it's just, I mean, the spectators are like 40 people deep. Mm. Um that, that they sell beer. I mean, there's farming companies advertising over there. It's not even sports. You need to get outside sponsorship where it's not just cycling, where you know there's enough viewers or visitors that it's going to get the brand return on investment. To be fair, that yeah. is most big teams, though, like yeah. Bora, Hansgrohe, all that kind yeah, of stuff. All, all, yeah, all of the big Tour de France teams are, are mostly sponsored outside of cycling. And I, I don't, but, and you'll usually find that actually the owners of those companies are massive cyclists and that's why they're involved. And it's probably a huge loss making exercise. But like, I don't know. F for me, what I would love to see in cycling is teams that are constant because it would be it would be so much easier for me to get behind a team if it was like better branded well i don't know i think i don't know i almost i almost feel like it i feel like i want it to be regional like i'd love there to be like uh, a northern cycling team that like i don't know i just think it'd be wicked i, I would i would get behind a like you know i can't yeah. even think what they would be called <laughs> that's what i mean just give them names so every year they can have a title sponsor whoever it is but the team has a name like for example, if I see if I see something about the Welsh team, Team Wales, in like some kind of you know Commonwealth Games or whatever, uh, well I guess it usually is the Commonwealth Games. Because it's Team Wales, I'm drawn to it being Welsh. It just it just happens. I'm just drawn to it. So if there was if there were teams in the, in the Tour de France, if there was a team in the Tour de France which was, and not, I'm not saying Team GB because that makes me think of British cycling and that's a whole different thing. But if there was a team which was like, you know, Northern Cyclists Alliance, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know, I can't Zing. think of something. Then I would be like, right, bang, there's my team, I'm in. Yeah, that's what I mean. And then, yeah, and then it doesn't matter if the riders change. Exactly. Or sponsors change. You've got a set kind of colours. You, you have a bit of a kit that you design or you can redesign it, but it's, Look at what football, they, I mean, I don't even watch football, but look at what they're doing because they are clearly money-wise doing well. Now on to our big question. Do traditional cycling clubs still have a place in 2024? We have a very extensive list of good things and some bad things and just some discussion points on this. Yeah, we so, were going to do this as an overrated, underrated one week, weren't we? And then we talked about it so much that we thought it could be a bigger... Piece. Yeah. So an obvious one for the good things about cycling clubs is they are a great place to meet new people, especially if you live in rural places or in super, super populated places where like London's a great example. You, you, we, you, we lived in London. Well, we lived in a particular flat in London for the last two years or whatever it was that we lived there. And we saw we spoke to our neighbors a couple of times a month and you know, like you basically don't meet people. Um, so clubs are a great way to do it. One of our good friends, Nick Harnett, one of his best mates is because he decided to join a cycling club, Islington CC, and then made mates, which are now his life friends. Uh, so it is a great place to meet new people. Um, they are always regular. So I am, I'm a very good example of someone which finds it hard to get out of the door unless I have uh, some kind of motivation, which is why I like park run for running. It's there every Saturday. 
Uh, clubs are all cycling clubs are great for they're always going to be riding whatever day of the week plus whatever day of the weekend and you're probably going to be riding with the same people or similar people and they're always going to be there and you know it's a good way of having that reliability and regularity which i think is good you guys got anything else to add or is this, or is this just <laughs> we were just me? listening we were just listening <laughs> to your um ted talk yeah i guess also if i think if you're new to cycling they're particularly good because you you meet people and you learn about cycling and culture and all of that i mean hopefully not the bad parts of that because there is you know like the rules and all of that kind of stuff but the the good stuff you know etiquette and just the the sort of language people use and the sort of rituals people do and um yeah and also i guess they don't they don't usually cost that much as far as i can see it's usually like something up like 30 quid a year it get i i think it it gets expensive if you want to race, race yes but to just join a club yeah it's not that expensive it's not it's not golf memberships no yeah and but then is there an expectation that you buy the club kit and then perhaps it does get expensive maybe yeah i don't know how enforced they are but yeah. i can see if everyone else is buying it you wouldn't want to be left out would you two massive positives for cycling clubs uh traditionally they would teach good riding etiquette mm. uh, inherently riding bikes is dangerous um, and there are certain things that you can do whilst you're out riding to limit the risk. An easy one, which I always bang on about, is if you're riding next to someone, if you're riding shoulder to shoulder, if you get hit by a crosswind or something, rather, you're just going to bounce off their shoulder rather than into their handlebars and you both hit the deck. So clubs typically will teach safe riding etiquette. Uh, but also on the subject of racing and grassroots racing, which we've talked about quite a bit this episode, that at least in this country that basically exists because of cycling clubs it'll be cycling clubs that are hosting the junior races or the senior races uh the cyclocross races it's all hosted by the clubs it isn't british cycling that are hosting most of if not any of the you know the, it's the clubs that are doing that um and it's those events which are essentially bringing through athletes whether they're professional or not um so without those clubs a lot of that stuff does not happen and just wouldn't happen. It's also good for finding new routes in your local area if you don't know which, because all the different clubs will ride different places and different routes and just you can learn more about where, you, where you're riding. So it sounds like the answer to our question is yes, they're great. <laughs> no, because we thought of also, we thought of some things that they maybe don't do so well. And obviously, I think really, this it's on a club to club basis, isn't it? Some... Some clubs are great. Some clubs are not so good. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's the case. I think committee structure can be a really good thing, but I think it can also, the rigidity of that organized fun can sometimes cause issues. So, so I guess by committee structure, you mean because it's an official affiliated club, it will have some kind of structure with someone which is in charge. and There's a hierarchy. Which can call, which can make a club uh, less flexible, perhaps. Yeah, totally. And I think the the vibe of that club can really be made or broken by that committee. And obviously, that committee will usually change mm -hmm. as well. Um, and that can really make a sudden shift in the experience. I would say. Yeah. So fair. it's a bit. I mean, maybe it's a bit like. Um, dating you have to find your right one not every club is going to be the right fit for you definitely and therefore you have to shop around uh some clubs are known for being unbelievably elitist which isn't a bad thing as long as you know that some people want that uh, uh, some people want elitist clubs because that fits them so yeah i'm not good for this because I think different clubs. Because you are Mr. Elitist. No, because I rule my club with an iron fist. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> dictatorship properly. Like there's no committee. There's no. Um, I don't think it's always bad. I think it's difficult. The, the real difficult thing is if you've got a massive club, it's really good to have all inclusive and cater for everybody. So our club back home in South Africa, we used to do between four and five ride outs on a Saturday in different categories. So essentially the front guys, like they just called the A group. Um, they used to race, ride as hard as I can, as fast as I can. And there was a few professional cyclists that used to show up and it was just fast. And then obviously it gets slower as it goes in different distances. If you've got a really small club 
I don't think you can cater for everybody because we've noticed with our club where we've got less than 40 members, but um, the majority ride at roughly a pace of between 16 and 19 miles an hour average speed. So if you then all of a sudden throw somebody in that's new to cycling and can only ride 12 miles an hour, which is perfectly fine, or somebody like James that wants to ride at 28 miles an hour, it's just going to cause a massive problem because then you have to make the majority of the club change their ride for the minority. Mm-hmm. And that because you can't make two or three groups because if you've got three groups and there's only like six people and showed up and then you've got people riding on in pairs. Yeah. So I think smaller clubs, some of the clubs do need to start off with finding an identity of what they want to do. Those clubs can eventually grow. Muckle's a really good example up here. They started small, I think five guys started something and then eventually now the club's got over 100 members. So it had to more from them just doing absolutely monstrously long rides to doing a few different things like chain gangs and stuff like that. But yeah, so you, you can't, being an elitist club, I don't know, elitist is the wrong word, but like a club that caters for a certain, if you've got a club where you've got five or six guys that just want to wear fancy clothes, buy expensive bikes and just ride to the local cafe, have a drink and ride back, well, so be it. If you had 200 members and you're letting everybody come in, then you might want to change it up slightly. I, I actually agree with you in the sense Good that point. I don't think that there's anything wrong with establishing an identity which is, we can't possibly cater for all people, whether that's because you're new or you you know you don't have the capabilities or whatever. I think the problem is when you don't um, signpost that and yes. up front. Yeah. Just be upfront about yeah. it. If you're you know if you don't have the proper structure in place to do a shorter shorter lower speed, lower ride. speed yeah. ride, whatever it is, then just say that. But I think the I think in this day and age, sometimes clubs feel pressured to say on their website, we cater for all abilities, all genders, all minorities, da, da, da. And then you go there and you get something completely unexpected. If you're not going to do it, don't say you're going to do it because then someone can make the decision to not turn up there. Because as much as I was saying before, it's really good for beginners to be part of something you can also be really put off if you turn up like uh, I remember speaking to her last ages ago this is when I was still in London and she just messaged me on Instagram but she was talking about a local club in South London and she said she turned up and they were literally just doing hill reps up and down and she was like I have I've not even done a hill on my bike like it was that kind of level it was such a disconnect but she was told to turn up they would cater for a blah 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 and then they just in her mind, left it. There was no support, and it was it was so disconnected from what she'd been sold. And I think that's probably the problem with and, it, isn't it? It goes back both ways. When I first moved to the UK, and I, I was racing back in the day, I mean, I just left. I was I was fast, and I, I went onto a, cl- a local club ride, and I showed up, and they didn't advertise that it was going to be a twelve and twelve mile an hour average, which is perfectly fine. But for me, it was just I, I showed up. I committed to it. I started on the ride and I didn't want to be like, well, this is just not what I was at that point in my life looking for. Now it would be perfect for me. But back then I just wanted to go and ride incredibly hard yep. um, and get my legs torn off. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I think, I guess in the past there was no other option other than to join your local club. Whereas because of the internet, people can connect with people and probably people that they're better suited to rather than we live in the same geographical area and we, we we both ride bikes that we might still be completely different cyclists whereas in theory the internet lets you connect with well more that, like-minded people if you can find the right place that is how i ended up meeting so many people that are still my friends now yeah like chris hall's a prime example of it he was one of the first people i met and it was the collective concept yeah uh which was in the previous early wave of cycling, so that's post 2012 wave, and then the rise of social media, once you hit kind of 2014, 2015, it was when like stuff got cool, e-commerce became a thing, uh, stuff became more accessible, the internet was blowing up and like cycling scenes were developing. And I'm very fortunate that I was on the London cycling scene when it was happening. And I ended up falling in line with people like Chris Hall, uh, Toby from Cold Dark North, because he used to spend a lot of time in London. And there was this crew of us of maybe 15, 20 of us. Uh, one of the lads had an Instagram account, which kind of like pulled it all together. It was, what did he say? It was 10,000 kilometers CC. And it was Richard Fraser's vision of aim for consistent. It was all about consistency. It, his thing wasn't about performance, it was just about consistency. If you're consistent every week, then 
riding 10,000 kilometers in a year is achievable, which is for the record, a huge distance. And most people are not able to achieve it. Um, but that's by the by. And we ultimately just used to ride a lot together as a collective, but it is a, we were essentially a cycling club. What you could argue is that's exactly what Nick's talking about. That is a club that sets out very specifically their purpose and what you can expect from doing it. If yeah. you like these things, then this is for you. Rather than we're a traditional club, everyone welcome. But f- fundamentally, it 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 really was a club. Yeah. Because we used to meet on most days of the week, but not all days of the week. We would ride, we'd go for coffee, we'd go to work. On a weekend, we would meet up and do a longer ride. Yeah. But this is where British Cycling is coming in. Pay, you now as a club have to pay to be part of what they do. But and you don't just, need to be part of it. That's what racing, I mean, exactly. Yes, that's what it's what redundant. So we're doing this with a bike shop at the moment. Um, we're going to do Saturday ride out, gravel. This is for gravel. Um, but anybody's welcome. We're going to set out what we want to do, the kind of idea. And if you don't like it, just... Well, hopefully you do. But if you don't, you can just go your own pace. We're going to put the, ri- the route out and you just ride. Well, I, I actively do not go on your rides because they're never actual gravel rides. Same. Are you telling me that you're actually doing proper gravel rides now? Or are you still doing your stupid mountain biking stuff? It's not. He likes to fling people down very muddy hills. And I stuff. don't because you can walk down if you want. It's gravel. Gravel's a weird term. I don't think anybody knows. It's just that's what we like to do. Most of the guys I ride with enjoy doing it, and that's why we do it. My um, question is: Are your inclusive gravel rides actually mountain bike rides, like your usual rides? Yes. Okay. Cool. Thank <laughs> you. So I still not to be going on them. <laughs> Um, we do know some amazing clubs. Uh, I know if Francis was here, he would be shouting about Kingston Wheelers. So that's the club that he was a junior with. They are huge. They're in London. They ride around Richmond Park a lot and Surrey. Uh, we know plenty of people that, excuse me, have and do ride for them. They're amazing club. Um, so I'll, shout about them on his behalf yeah do you know what i actually had a look on their website when i was trying to look at what the sort of cost of joining a cycling club was because in my mind it was hundreds of pounds but it's only 30 pounds a year but one of the things i saw so when you come up on their homepage, you see an faq section and it said f one of the faqs was how many women are in the club and it said there's something like 50 you're more than welcome we also have a dedicated women's officer and we have a policy of inclusivity and da 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 and that i would say is something that would make me go to that club yeah, yeah. just just mentioning that well it would it would actually make me want to go to that club more yeah. as as a, a a male yeah because uh, for me i look if if they're treating people like that then the likelihood is they're not going to be horrible to me either yeah and i mean this is it you can it's all well and good saying it but you have if you're going to say it, you have to be prepared to deal with incidents if they do occur and mm-hmm. deal with them in the appropriate way and i do i'm not going to name names but i do know there are clubs that say that and then something actually happens and it is not dealt with yep. appropriately so i'm um, that's not kingston wheelers but but you know having a dedicated women's officer for example would be something Good. that would make me, you know, if there was any sort of incidents, I would feel like they would, I could go to them and it would be addressed properly in a way that it made me feel like I could be comfortable in that club. Um, obviously there are other minorities as well that definitely feel, are going to feel out of place in what's predominantly a very like white male environment. So I think again, don't offer it if you're not prepared to do it and fine. But if you are prepared to do it, then I think that is something that is very worthy of having a, club another version is uh Velociposse. these are all london based because this is kind of when we were looking for clubs wasn't it mm-hmm. Posse are predominantly for women trans and non-binary um focused around racing and sort of track but not just they do a lot of skill sessions and just ride sessions and just more bike proficiency they're super cool as well i think they they're were originally cool. like a fixed crit kind of like yes. racy team setup sort of thing. Not yeah. not just about racing, but they were they were very present in that space and then they grew and grew and grew. Yeah, and but- I was I was part of them for a while and it was absolutely great. And I've met a lot of people there that I rode with afterwards as well. You know, kind of, I guess there aren't a lot of women on bikes. So that was kind of a place that everyone congregated. So it helped me meet pe- other people like that. Yeah. This sounds horrible, but it shouldn't be needed. I mean, so when I was a kid riding, so our club back home, Select Cycling Club, had about 450 members. Um, and there's loads of different categories. So the race side, the social side, there was juniors, and then there was women. And they, every year, 
the club voted on captains. So you got your race captain, your road captain, your uh, ladies captain, and your junior captain. And then you go on the rides, and that person had full authority. So if somebody on a ride was misbehaving or doing something wrong, they would just get booted. Yeah. So you wouldn't have to have like just somebody that's got a bit of a, they get voted in, but somebody that's essentially there just to say, so there could be one girl with 30 guys. And if one of the guys is just behaving, somebody just go over and say, listen, do one. It, it shouldn't be that it's like. In an ideal world, yeah, that would happen. Just, yeah, but, totally. But like I said, this has been happening for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. It just, it should be more of a common thing in clubs. That's probably the first thing they should vote in. Um, just so there's somebody that's there as a kind of, your job is to just to make sure people, so if you ride too fast or you do something silly, it's just, or if somebody gets dropped, somebody that's aware that there's a new cyclist on the beginner's ride and they're struggling to back. So that person is just going to drop back with them and kind of make sure they're okay. So just a bit of a common sense. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what's lacking from some clubs then, common sense. Yeah. Tell us about your experiences with cycling clubs. If you love your club and you think they're doing great stuff, shout about them in the comments, send us an email, whatever you want to do, but tell us about them. We might even give them a little shout out one day. Maybe we can pile a list of the best clubs in the world. That would be great. You know how there's that um, glass door thing for... Business, like, bus yeah, yeah. If you, employees. A, employees, yeah, and you can kind of give them a rating and stuff. If there was something like that... Oh, there should be. There should that, be that would be for, sick. Yeah. We should... Um, should we start that? That would be awesome. I don't, I don't know if I have the skills to be able to create that, but that would be really cool based mm. on actual, you know, they say this, what do they actually offer? Yeah. And it updates per year as committees change and all of That's that kind so of thing. That's so good. Mm. Accountability. Mm. So time for a round of overrated or underrated. I'm going to read out a list of things and you're going to tell me if you think they're overrated or underrated. First up, route planning. Good route planning is underrated. Blessed are the route makers is uh, what Toby from Cold Dark North always says. Uh, bear in mind, he is known for being a route maker. So he's basically saying he's important and everyone should, <laughs> should, should worship him. But he is also very good at making routes. So I'd say that's probably fair. Route planning. Uh, I like not knowing. I, I like not making routes and just riding and just finding new places. I don't like doing that off-road because I'm always terrified of dogs attacking me. Um, so I think for off-road stuff, I usually rely on things that I know, which is why I ride the sea to sea, which is basically a pavement to the coast or into the Pennines. And I ride it route planning more is the most than underrated anything I've thing ever, ever. Yeah. Um, I would say knowing where you're riding, if somebody else has planned a good route, is you shouldn't bother with that. But somebody that you're going riding with should know where they're going. You say this, you don't ride. like to share your routes, but I think that requires the other person to have trust in you. Yes, but it's also because I plan my routes as I go. So <laughs> right. that's kind of, I've got a rough idea of what I want to do. And then I ride and then depending on conditions, wind conditions, rain, things happening, whether the, it's a weekend and the tracks are busy or whatever, or you're on the road and there's more traffic, I can adjust the route accordingly. But you can um, do that even with a planned route. I know, but that's, but I just, then if I change it, then you'd be like, oh, people panic. Bizarre. It's, just, it's just such a weird concept for me where with cycling clubs, well, people all need to know what the route is the day before. Because then you've got a preconceived idea what to expect. And then you could be like, oh, there's too many hills. I'm not going to enjoy it. Or we're going in this direction. I've been there once before. I didn't like it. And then, oh, I'm not going to enjoy the ride. And you come with a negative aspect. Where Perhaps they just need to plan their time. They need to know how long they're going to be out for. If some dodgy bloke said to me, oh, well, let's go for a ride. I'm not going to tell you where we're going. I'd be like, nah. <laughs> you've done it loads. You did it with me once. And we lied to Chris Healy saying it's only going to be an oh, hour and a half. That was terrible. And his wife was waiting it was like a six hour ride. Yeah. <laughs> that was terrible. I, I, he enjoyed it. He enjoyed you every minute of it. Trust. I messaged Helen to tell her that he's going to be late and she was fine. I used to get mega ride anxiety when I was relatively new to riding road bikes. So if I didn't know how long a ride was going to be, I, I, I basically had to mentally prepare for what was going to happen. So if I didn't know, I would, I, w I just wouldn't go on it because I would have just, I would have been like, well, no, I can just make my own route and then I can prepare for it mentally. That'd be more enjoyable if you didn't know. Well, <laughs> but, well, yeah, if it, it, being able to get over the ride anxiety, it would definitely have been better, which is, which is me now, I suppose. Next. Oh, wait, what are we saying? Under, underrated. Yeah. We all agreed. Yeah, it was underrated. underrated yeah. Uh, Multi-day riding, I think is underrated. 
As long as you stay in a spa hotel or somewhere, <laughs> like a swimming pool afterwards. Um, so I guess some people will think of this as racing. Some people will think of it as um, like or endurance, touring, like TCR. Some people will think about it as just like Emily said, bike packing. Some people will think about it as just doing multiple rides head to head, like on a ride on a bank holiday weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, for example. Uh, I think in most cases those things. Th- there's something added to riding back to back even if that's that's just from your own front door it just elevates the intensity of your experience in my opinion and i like it as long as you appropriately account for the additional mileage and you're fit enough to be able to do it like i'm not suggesting it's good if you're so unfit that it's just horribly uncomfortable and you shouldn't be doing it but some of the multi-day stuff i've done has been unbelievably satisfying and great fun yeah, like multi-day point-to-point stuff is fun. I mean, there's kind of no way out. My my, I do my best riding when there's no way to get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> you have no choice but to get home. But I guess you push yourself more. It it always hurts when you get up in the morning. And then it, you you feel a sense of achievement because of that, don't you? I, I think there's just so many factors to it. For that instance, that is quite good. Josh Reed was telling me when he did Atlas Mountain Race last year, um, he started coughing up blood. And he was like, he needs to scratch. But then he did the math realizing it'll take him longer to ride back to the previous checkpoint oh. instead of just carrying on. Um, I mean, that's hell. I don't know. It's just such a vast topic. I enjoy it. So I'd say underrated. Next up, or the final one on the list is cafe stops. So when I first started riding seriously, um, I used to ride with a couple of people in Essex a lot and cafe stops did not happen ever and it was it was actually so that that a lot of the people i used to ride with back then were triathletes or runners that did some cycling and what i learned a couple of years into riding really seriously is that cafe stops is was something that triathletes didn't do and road cyclists did do so it was always just alien to me it was just something i never experienced we used to just go out hammer the absolutely obliterate ourselves on a 100k ride and then you'd be riding back into town and be like right see you later and then you just all just everyone just went <laughs> home and then and then i learned about um well it was social because you know we'd still be chatting and stuff but when i then started doing more road stuff and getting i start hanging around with people like chris hall and you do as many coffee stops as possible and then it's all of a sudden a lot more enjoyable yeah, well, the triathletes <laughs> have got to go back and then do their running session as well, well yeah that's they? the thing yeah we'd i'd get home and do my brick right yeah. my brick run this becomes a lot more in-depth, though, if you really think about it, because a cafe stop during a long ride will hurt you. I hate it. Because the restart, your legs are just tired. It, but that's so, if it's a yeah. hard ride, yeah. So that's the thing on a hard ride. Um, but then there's a flip side. If you're really hungry and you didn't take enough nutrition with you, then it's great because you're getting some fuel in. Which but is yeah. also something I really Also, if do. you're going to do multi-day bikepacking or things like Chris Hall does, you need to get used to stopping a lot and starting again because it's kind of part of the training. Um, I do think every ride should end with some kind of coffee or social stop, whether it's coffee, beer, food, whatever it is, just because otherwise, like you say, you just ride and then everybody leaves each other. And it's So you're saying at the end rather than during? Uh, uh, yeah, definitely at the end. Some instances you need to during, but also some instances you should completely avoid stopping during the ride. Because if what's, it's what's really, an instance for that? If it's really cold, really hard ride, if you stop in the middle of the ride, you're warming up and then you have to get back out and be cold and tired and get going again. It is hard. Also, if you've got a cycling club and it's time sensitive, if you're stopping at a cafe for an hour, somebody might need to be home to do something yeah. else. Where if you stop at the end, that person can hang around for five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes, three, four hours if they want to. You are full of logic today, aren't you? <laughs> well, this, this is unusual. <laughs> <laughs> Keep sending us your suggestions to Wild Ones Podcast at cademedia.co.uk and we might read yours out in the next show. Next up, we have Fluff Up of the Week. I have a quick one. Oh, yeah. While I was reading through the emails for this week, we had one from Alex from Australia who basically said... I, th- I thought you were going to say Alex from GCN. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Alex from GCN, please stop talking about us. No, um, Alex from Australia who said that there is a black blob just behind my head, um, which... Every week he hates to see because he thinks that you there's You mean something. on the wall by behind your head? Yes. Uh, is yeah. it still there or have you got rid of it? It is still there. <laughs> and he says that uh, every week he tries to wipe his screen and it bugs him so much. And he just said, please, 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 can we remove it? Can can we 
can we get a pen, draw an arrow to it and call it the blob and it just be the blob forever? I mean, we could do, yeah. I think it's actually tape, isn't it, from where we've had something else stuck there in the past? I don't know. Do you want to remove it or do you want to? I want to make a big deal about it. I'm not sharpying on the wall while Francis is away. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to sharpie behind Jimmy's head now on the door. What, and call his head the blob? No, just make another. <laughs> <laughs> arrow point at his head. Arrow to Jimmy. How was rude. Blob. Unbelievable. Okay, well, I'm going to get a sharpie then and do that. I was going to get rid of it, but sorry, Alex, we're not. Well, you're going to do it right now? Yeah. A few minutes later. Sorry to Francis if you see this. Jimmy said I could paint on the wall. Are you devil poured? Blob. Devil poured? Is that what you call it? Yeah, yeah. Does that work? It's a bit small, isn't it? Yeah, you should have done it much bigger. No, leave it. No, don't redo it. Don't redo it. No, it's perfect. So, okay, Alex, we fixed it for you. There you go. Um, now for more listeners take over we have an email from Jordan titled to wax or not to wax it seems like I'm being bombarded by content about how great running a wax chain is for road cycling is running a wax chain all it's cracked up to be maybe just for a longevity of components perspective well surely this is one for you Nick uh, I'm, a, I'm a naysayer to wax there, there's a massive issues with wax I mean I get that they can talk about it being cleaner. They can talk about and making components last longer. But both of those situations are in ideal world situations in terms of you properly treat the chain, you properly wax it, and you properly stay on top of the wax. The other issue that I've got with it is that um, if the wax starts getting into your rear mech in between the pivots and things like that, I've seen uh, with some of that wend wax back in the day, that being a problem, and then it just starts sticking. Oh no, wend was a proper wax. Was, yeah. That stuff was horrible though. I don't and think... Then, my, my research suggests that current waxing is not comparable to the when stuff back in the day. Fair enough. And then my next issue with is hot waxing where people take their chains off and dip them in wax baths and things like that. Fair enough if you want to do that. But from a bike shop or you guys or GCN or anybody online's perspective, you might cause yourself a lot of problem by recommending it because... Shimano, SRAM, and Compaq, the three main chain manufacturers, says you cannot reuse their split links. So really? Unless you're telling these customers that they have to put new split links in. Compaq will go further and say, you can't use a new split link on an old chain. What? So if you do this every week, unclipping your chain and clipping it back in, you suffer the risk of your chain failing, your split link. Now, I know there's going to lots of people are going to comment saying they've never had any issues, but I'm just saying that's fair enough. I'm happy for you, but I can't say that you can do it because that opens me up to a massive public, sorry, professional liability lawsuit. So I, I used to have a, a Whipperman chain. Yes, yeah, so Whipperman, Whipperman chains actually say you can do it. Because it's, yeah. like it's, like, it's a special link. Split that, link. No, yeah. it doesn't even need a chain tool. They're really good uh, chains. We sell them for 11 speed in the They're shop. They're expensive, mind. Yes. Uh, they last quite well, but yeah. that's fine. And a KMC also do uh, reusable split link chains. Right. But... Do they work with 13-speed Compaq or do they work with SRAM flat-top chains? Uh, some people might say they've found they do, but from once again, from a shop's perspective, we can't say this. And it worries me that some of these YouTube channels or bike shops are telling customers this is fine because the manufacturers say it's not. So if somebody, uh, there's a lad in our club that actually does it and he has snapped two split links from doing it. Um, I've not told him to, I've told him not to do it. But if he, if he was to crash and break his hip or his neck and comes off as from a split link snapped and he just says so and so told me that it's okay to do it yeah and he's uh, opened himself up to a, well he's opened them up to a massive lawsuit so from my perspective don't do it if you're going to use wax use something like squirts drip wax um, or wax your chain when you've just bought it and then that's it and then you never again. again yeah use the drip on wax it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting perspective that I've never heard anyone ever talk about. Which is wild. Why? So yeah. I'm, I'm really interested to see if the, what, because there's going to be so many people that watch slash listen to this that do wax their chain and have either not considered that, don't care about that. But I'm interested to get any people commenting on the YouTube video or send us emails if you have had issues with your quick links snapping or damaging as a result of taking it on and off so you can wax it, I think that's a really interesting thing to explore. It um, is, yeah. Last time we talked about wax, which is a while ago, people were very passionate. The the 
waxers were passionate, weren't they? Yeah. It's, it, and I'm assuming they're not changing their quick link every time. No. No way. So next up, we have a question from Lee. In the past, when buying a new bike, one would prioritize the frame because the components, group set, wheels, etc., can always be upgraded later. Is this still true, or does one prioritize the components because those can be moved onto a new frame? I think it's actually a really good question. It's definitely something that I have, I guess, experimented with in the past. I always used to work on the basis of get... I, so alloy frames were specifically something I was interested in. So I always used to get the best alloy frame I could, and then I would upgrade the components until they were as best as I could possibly afford. And I'd ended up with a really cool, relatively light, durable bike. Well, durable in the sense that I could crash it in crit races and probably still be fine. Um, it is an interesting thing. What are people doing these days? I think it's massively budget dependent. So if your budget allows, if it's a massive budget, then do whatever you want. But I would say if your budget's middle of the road and you are, have plans on upgrading your bike eventually, then you need to start thinking where's the best place to spend the money. Uh, Upgrade your bike is in your frame, do you mean? Frame or groups that are wheels. So right. depending on what you buy. The, the, it's just such a complex thing to get into because certain expensive frames aren't better than certain cheaper frames. Uh, we've established with group sets from something like a rival to a red or a 105 to Jira Ace. It's a bit of weight. It's not really going to perform that much better. So it depends where you, you start, what yeah, your starting point is. Yeah, where you're going. It? So, yeah. yes, um, I was saying if you're going to buy a bike for £3,000 as an example, I would prioritize the group set and the wheels because if you buy something like SRAM Force um, and a decent set of wheels, but a more entry level frame set, you will keep that group set on several bikes and then later swap your frame out. So it's a bit of a but if you if you're buying a frame set that's three thousand pounds and you're spending obviously that's an extreme and you expend very little on an incredibly basic eight speed group set, you're just not gonna enjoy the bike to start off with. Yeah, as much. I, I I actually think so from when I used to dabble with how I wanted to build my bike many years ago, I actually think the difference in the space between group sets has narrowed so much. So actually, like if a bike has 105 Ultegra or Dura Race in a Shimano sense, there's not really any, in my opinion, there isn't really any difference apart from some weight. They're basically the same group set. So like, actually, if you can afford at least a one, if you know, if, if, if you can afford a 105 Ultegra or Dura Race group set, then get the 105 one and spend the rest of the money on a better set of wheels. Because you will know, in my opinion, you'll notice the difference between a really good quality, maybe probably carbon wheel set versus a really cheap alloy heavy wheel set. 100%. You're, you're, the main things you're going to feel and notice in a bike is your wheels, your handlebars, the tape, and the saddle. Those are the main things to get right to start off with. And then use the rest of your budget wisely around it. The next thing would be if you're running disc brakes, hydraulic disc brakes are always going to work better than mechanical disc brakes. So that yep. makes a big thing. And then also whether the budget allows you to go from mechanical to electronic gears. Um, mm -hmm. If you can go straight away to electronic gears, a decent wheel set, but you have to compromise on the frame set, I would go that way first. Otherwise, if you buy, you should be buying again and again. So Yeah. 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 I, I, I think that's a good point. I, I do like the idea of buying a bike to a set thing and then planning on upgrading stuff if you can, but be sensible about it. Try and not waste as much. If you're going to buy a set of alloy wheels, buy a nice set of alloy wheels where you think if you get carbon down the line, you can still use the alloy wheels as like a winter wheel set or as a training wheel set. Maybe this is actually something that we can maybe even make a video about in the future. Almost like the, the things broom. to consider. Like for yeah. example, if you're buying, like there are some, there are really good alloy wheels. It doesn't have to be a carbon wheel yeah. set, but to make it a really good alloy wheel set, it will probably have sealed bearings rather than cone bearings. Whereas a lot of the alloy or the cheaper end of alloy wheel sets will probably have rubbish bearings in them. So it's it's like it's knowing the minimums that actually make it a good investment. Um, and and the same applies to like if you're going to buy if you've got money to buy a new bike, if you can get a disc brake bike you're going to have a better experience than if you buy a rim brake bike. Yeah. What's the verdict here then? I, I think the verdict is 
It's difficult. There's, there's too many variables. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on your budget. It depends on what your Priorities. how much you plan to spend over the next few years. If you've got one amount of money, which is a one-off, or are you in a position that you want to spend 750 quid every six months, 10 months, 12 months, because you get a little bonus from work and that's what you want to do. And therefore you can probably build some kind of upgrade options. There's just too many variables. So finally, I want to finish up with a message from Guy. And he says, hey guys, is that multiple of him? <laughs> just wanted to say a big thank you to Nick for his recommend recommendation for winter gloves. I brought a pair of these work gloves from Amazon straight after the podcast last Thursday. They arrived on Saturday. I have now used them in both cold and rainy conditions and Nick is a genius. There are not many people which say that. <laughs> so much better than so-called branded cycling gloves. So much better that I've ordered a second pair in a different colour. Keep up the great work with the podcast and general bits and pieces. Yeah, so we have had in the last couple of weeks since Nick mentioned his cycling glove hack, we have had so many emails from people asking for a link. And I haven't emailed them back because I didn't know what the specific link was. But we have now confirmed what the link is. And it was in no way an advert, but on Amazon, you can make something into an affiliate link, which we have done. I will put it in the description of this podcast. And if you click on it, it means we make a little bit of money. You can choose not to click on it. You can just put it in the search bar yourself. It's just cold storage gloves, as we mentioned last time. But if you would like to click on the link, it means that we will make a little bit of money on, which we will probably use on coffees before the podcast because uh, it's cold in here and Francis <laughs> won't let us turn the heating on so we can warm up like that. I'm not sure how much the commission is. The absolute no, maximum, before, the maximum that uh, Amazon says is 12%. Yeah, but based on how cheap the gloves are, I don't think it's going to be a lot. It's, yeah, it'd be a couple of pennies. <laughs> it might be pennies. You do not have to click on this link. And the original thing was not an advert, but I mean, they let you do it. So I'm what, just why I'd, not? I didn't think of this first. <laughs> we'll share any we'll share the 12 pence that we make don't say, hey don't say that i want to share it in for you. <laughs> we bought him the coffee uh keep sending us your stories questions and fun stuff to wild ones podcast at cademedia.co.uk before we go i just want to say a massive thank you to all of you thanks for listening thank you to those of you that have left us five star reviews and thanks to those of you that keep liking our stuff and subscribing on youtube it really makes a massive difference to us. Your continued support is what allows us to keep putting out this show for free. So please keep doing what you're doing. We do massively appreciate it. We love you. You are beautiful. Thank you very much. <laughs>